Hello, and welcome to another very special episode of the Sales Ops Demystified podcast. And actually, today, we're going to be taking a slightly different approach. Um, we welcome Rachel Haley to the show, who has super interesting, a relevant experience for the audience. And so what we're going to be doing in this episode is diving into Rachel's story and Rachel's experience. Uh, we have Salesforce there, we have Snowflake there as well. Um, and we'll be bringing that around to the work that Rachel is doing today in the sales ops world. So Rachel, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. And the the, the first question is still going to remain the same, actually, which is, how did you initially enter the sales ops world? Right. It's a good, it's an interesting story because when people ask me that question, I really fell into it. It wasn't planned, so to speak. When I was in university, I wasn't necessarily thinking that that was something I would go into. Um, Even though I went to school in Silicon Valley, for some reason, the the startup ecosystem wasn't as prevalent when I graduated in 2010 as it is today. Uh, So I started my career in finance, actually. um, And I worked at an asset management firm for a couple years. And it was actually during that time that I realized the biggest value driver for all of these <clears throat> investors and the portfolios that they have is from these entrepreneurs that can really take an interesting idea and develop it and build it out into something very useful for the consumer for another business over time. And so at that point, I figured, okay, that is where all the fun action is. And that's what I want to do. In fact, I actually want to start my own company. I wanted to build a product. And so the interesting thing about the finance trajectory is that after your two years working at a firm, generally you go into venture capital or private equity. So when I had those interviews set up, actually, it was more of a Trojan horse kind of strategy where I would go in an interview as an associate, but I would actually pitch my idea midway through. So I actually had like a proper presentation and a pitch deck. I thought, okay, in five years, I actually want to be my own boss and a founder of this company. And here's my idea. It's a wedding planning event application. Mm. And they sort of, they were a little stunned, a little surprised. Nobody was irritated, surprisingly. And um, they're like, well, that's, that's really ambitious and great. The problem is you have no skills at all for someone that we would invest in. I was like, well, fair, (laughs) very fair. You know, you, you've never, you don't have any technical skills. You're a single founder and you don't have any operational skills either, which is something that is really useful in terms of scaling a business. So why don't you get all three of those or two of the three, and then we'll talk in a few years. So I did that. I worked at Salesforce in their finance and strategy department. It was sort of a bridge between finance and operations. So I got to see how a nice big company that was public and had been public for a few years was operating, but more at a 50,000 foot level. And during that time, I learned how to program. I picked up my technical skills as the advice from the venture capitals (laughs) investors suggested. So I learned Python and SQL and JavaScript and then started building out my own applications for fun on the Salesforce platform. Just to quickly jump in, did you learn those languages as part of your role at Salesforce or is that something that you just done on the side? Yeah, just on the side, my goal was to always go back to or to to start my own company. That was always the the like north star that I was pointing towards. So it was something that I just did in my free time. Yeah, the, sure. And then continue with the uh, with the story. Sorry for jumping in. Sure, no, no problem. Um, so I took time to learn those skills. And then what I realized is my current co-founder and partner, um, Greg Daly, who also runs my current company, Claris Designs with me, was doing something somewhat similar at his startup. So he worked for a company called AdRoll and they were building out the business intelligence function. And so he was hiring BI analysts and trying to understand the best way to look at data. And then people started to ask us in our network just relevant either data analytics questions or sales operations questions or even some technical questions. And we just started answering them and fielding them. And then one day we thought, you know, we should just start a consulting company and start charging for this. And then that's sort of how we started our current company, Claris Designs. It was a outsourced sales ops or sales ops as a service consulting company. We started that in 2015 And we got to work with a variety of small to mid-sized companies and really see where they were struggling in terms of these key inflection points from with revenue trajectory. So as you know, 
getting from one to 5 million, there are some hurdles and five to 15, 15 to 50, 50 to hundred million and hundred million and beyond. And they all have different types of issues. So it's really interesting to see all of those, all of those um, different types of problems. So that's really how I, I got into it. I just sort of fell backwards into it with the intention of eventually starting my own product company. So we can look at the Salesforce experience almost as the bridge between the, the early stage finance skilled person and the entrepreneur. Right. That is exactly what it was. Mm -hmm. And it was a okay. really cool opportunity to have that ability to work in a company and see a product that had such a sticky platform and a large ecosystem of people who are also building on top of it. And also extreme credibility as well, I guess, especially in the Salesforce world. If you could count the number of times the Salesforce has been mentioned on this podcast, uh, like it's, it's pretty much like one to one episode to mentions of Salesforce, right? So every, I guess every sales ops or salesperson you speak to it, it, with your work in class designs is aware of them. And that gives you some authority in those conversations. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and but at the same time, I think this may have been whilst you were, well, uh, like post you had started Claris, you also had two other roles, I think, at other companies, specifically Snowflake. Right. So <clears throat> the... The interesting thing that occurred when we started consulting was that we had a very academic, academic approach to solving these problems. So I think that they were still useful for the companies to implement. A lot of them were, you know, ideas that we'd thought about or things we'd actually build from like a configuration perspective. But the, the big feedback that we got, and it was valid, was that, you know, well, you haven't actually really done this before. You've never really worked at a company or you never have where you saw it at, you know, revenue point A, and then you were with the company as it scaled to revenue A plus B. And we're really looking for someone who can speak to that experience. And after the, you know, fifth or sixth time of someone actually giving us that feedback, I thought, okay. This is probably skills that I should at least get myself because it's it's a something that I want to do to eventually being back to the company. I think Claris Designs will be able to scale a lot faster and further than I initially anticipated if I can get some some experience like this. And also, I was interested in learning how to evolve these solutions while working in-house at a company. It's really interesting being a consultant. You get one perspective where you parachute in, you fix everything, and then you you leave because you, you don't want to be a single point of failure indefinitely for that company. But if you work there full time, you get to see how one solution evolves over time and how you iterate it and how it's actually implemented and all the smaller details that you maybe miss out on from a consultant perspective. So it was, it was something I was really interested in doing. So I worked at Sumo Logic for about a year, that was a company that we were working with. And I met a lot of great people. And one of the uh, VPs of corporate sales, his name is Mark Wenling, actually went to a company called Snowflake. And he was running corporate sales there. And he still is today. And then about a year into Sumo, uh, he called me and he said, you know, I know that this is what you're looking for. You're looking for this explosive growth and a rocket ship and this story that will really help build your resume and your career. He's like, Snowflake is it. No one's heard of it. This is mid-2017, maybe July 2017. Yeah. And he thought, but and no one is working extensively on sales operations. They just hired a VP, but it's really just greenfield in terms of what you could do and build and scale here. So it's like, this is something really special. I know that you haven't been at Sumo Logic for that long, but it's worth making the leap so early on because I think this is really special. Yeah. Um, and so I did. It was a little bit nerve wracking, but I started there and it was a great ride. I started when they were around 30 AEs and or less than 30 million in ARR and then left when they were around, you know, this March around 450 AEs and then, you know, wow. 500 million in ARR. Yeah, crazy, crazy growth in that amount of time. Over the past few weeks, we've spoken to a hundred sales leaders around the world to understand the impact of COVID-19 on revenue. And we've combined these insights into one single report that covers the immediate impact, the commercial outlook, the tech stack that you need, and actionable advice for sales leaders. You can claim this whole report completely for free 
if you go to ebster.com forward slash COVID. That's ebster.com forward slash COVID. So, I, I mean, A, I, I think uh, the, the gentleman's name who was running corporate sales at Snowflake, he, he seems like he knew exactly how to communicate to you the value of the role. So it sounds like he did a great job. Uh, and obviously, he was right in his prediction as well. So that's amazing. And so this is interesting. So we said that Salesforce was kind of the bridge between the early stage person with finance experience and somebody who wanted to start their own business. And it seems like the other two uh, experiences, Sumo and Snowflake, helped you, after you had the business, help you take that business to the next level. Is, right. is that accurate? That's exactly right. Amazing. So quickly to jump into, let's just talk about the, the Snowflake IPA or that experience. When you left, how many A's did they have? Because you started with 30, I think, or 45. Yeah, it was around, it was a little bit over 460-ish AEs getting wow. getting to, yeah, 600 by the end of the year. Mm-hmm. What was your, your key learning from, from, it sounds like almost 10xing the amount of reps you were working with? Right, more than that. Um, <clears throat> there's so many, I would say, from... An, if we take from an operational perspective purely, I would say that it's never too early to invest in sales operations as a team and company prioritization and objectives around getting key processes and systems set up accordingly. Uh, one of the conversations that I have had a couple of times with the current CRO, Chris Degnan, and it's one of my favorites is he, you know, and he's mentioned this before to to some of the Snowflake investors that he wishes he would have invested more budget um, into sales operations early on. And he wishes that he would have been able to, you know, bring in more senior people and invest in that role and prioritize that type of work earlier on. And obviously the company is still doing extremely well and it will continue to do well. But that was something that he and I would talk about. And so I think that, you know, we were able to manage, but the the issues that we would often run into going at that type of pace is we were very reactive. Um, and I think that if we had really taken the time earlier on when the growth wasn't as explosive to set up some key fundamental processes and systems and had the resources to do that, it would have made that scaling even, even easier. I mean, that's just really great news for us here on the podcast, <laughs> the, the importance <laughs> yeah. of sales. But because you joined when there are 30 AEs, I think you said. Right. And mm-hmm. you were the first dedicated sales ops person. Um, there was one other analyst and then a, a VP who was, she was building out the entire team. But I was the first person looking at anything from a data or analytical perspective as well as processes. So, yes. <laughs> Got it. That is just, that's just great to hear that somebody who retrospectively has gone through that kind of scale wishes they had sales ops in or processes it in before. That's super interesting. Um, okay, so it was always the goal to build a business. I assume it wasn't always the goal to build a business around sales ops. But I, well, actually, to, to, we should actually introduce Clarice Devines into the story now, right? Because I don't think it's just sales ops that you guys do work on, if I'm, if I'm correct. That's, that's correct. Yes. Okay. So, right. So Claire's designs, it, that is how it started. Um, and you're right. The original goal, my original goal back in, you know, 2013, so seven years ago, uh, was to build a product, a product for either consumers, something B2C or other businesses. So when I started Claire's designs or when we started Claire's designs in 2015, it was a consulting agency purely. And the benefit of a services in business is that you can generate revenue rather quickly. um, And so you can bootstrap without having to take on VC funding and then sort of figure out what you want your long-term plans to be. So Claris Designs today in its capacity still maintains um, a big chunk of its revenue from you know, sales ops as a service and sales ops consulting. We also have two other lines of business. So one of them is an outsourcing team. So we ha- we work with a lot of really small companies who don't have the capital to maybe hire an internal SDR team or BDR team uh, or generate a bun- you know, variety of leads or contacts for their system. So we have a team in the Philippines that works directly with a team that are a client that we hire here and they help write or put in, generate 
leads, find contacts, prospects, clean your database, as well as sequence these people. So that's something that we've really scaled over the last few years as well. It's quite large. There are around 100 people that we have working for us overseas. And then the third line is a product that we've actually built on, on the force.com platform, which is really cool to kind of bring it full circle to my time at Salesforce. Um, and this is a tool that really helps to automate some of the general day-to-day blocking and tackling issues that a lot of sales ops administrators of Salesforce specifically or sales ops analysts deal with on a daily basis. So whether it's, you know, updating large amounts of data, which normally you'd have to do outside of the system or finding duplicates or highlighting issues in your data in terms of maybe users who own who are inactive that currently own records. There's a variety of health checks that we scan and then an ability to edit that data within the system as well. So it's it's very new. We only have one paying customer, but it's exciting that we've we recently launched that in last month. And it just totally makes sense from the last of my 10 years of your career, that that is something you would be able to build, right? Because yeah. A, you have the Salesforce experience, B, you've had this extensive sales ops experience, um, and you also have been consulting with various different clients on sales ops. So it totally makes sense that that would be an evolution of the, the last 10 years. So awesome. Now, back to the question before that then is, you, you always had the aspirations to become an entrepreneur, but I assume you didn't always have the aspirations to... Uh, build a business around sales ops because you mentioned the wedding planning app in Mm -hmm. the in the first question so at what point did you think that yes actually sales ops is something that i want to to base my career around or build a business around great question i think it was when we had our first client in 2015 um they were a small marketing a tech agency, and they asked for help building their compensation plan. And I had never done that before. Greg had built, my co-founder had built a dozen for his company, AdRoll, which is a competitor in the same space. So he was very well experienced in order to take on that um, project. And so working with him on that and then coupling it with the little that I knew about Salesforce automation at that time, thinking, oh, interesting. Okay, well then... If an op, like, this is how the AEs are incentivized. But what would be really cool is if you could display some type of tracking or mechanism or incentive, like incentivized gaming element within the system. So managers knew how their AEs were tracking against their quota. So it's like you have this, this comp plan built offline, which I thought was a super interesting problem to solve. I had never actually solved something like that specifically before. And then tailoring it with visualizing that data to AEs on a daily basis with the dashboard to keep them motivated. You know, I thought that, I thought, and maybe I'm a huge nerd, I thought that was one of the most interesting problems I had solved yet. And I just started to really love all of the problems that exist and need to be solved within sales operations and how many companies uh, struggle with solving it. Uh, it's such a bigger part of an organization today than it was even five years ago and continues to play more and more of a strategic role. So once I solved these really interesting problems and was also able to build something in the system, I thought this is definitely what piques my interest and what I'm really excited and passionate about. And it's also something that a lot of people happen to struggle with. And so I thought this is great. I really love working on these problems and people sometimes seem to struggle with it. So I think it's a great fit. Makes total sense. Now, fast forwarding to today, I'd like to ask about the current challenges right, that, that you're seeing clients face as we move into Q4 of 2020. Is there something that keeps coming up? Is there, are there things that clients are being challenged with that, and you've noticed a pattern of those? Yes, I think that from a systemic issue, which I'm sure you've discussed you know, a lot on the podcast, is the element of working remote. And so the fact that we're still in a situation with the global pandemic and everyone working remotely and in San Francisco, nobody's gone back to the office whatsoever. So it's definitely uh, going to remain that way for the rest of 2020 and probably early 2021. I think it's being able to really communicate and lead teams that have worked so well together in person problem solving from a remote vantage point. That's been really challenging from from what we see companies having to work through. And then also maintaining 
their current output given the the top line hit that they've seen. So we've seen a lot of our companies have to look for more creative ways to outsource things that they were solving or part of their processes internally out to either a company like ours or somewhere else that's a cheaper and more economical solution. So I'd say at a high level that it's really just dealing with the effects of COVID. I think for the most part, a lot of companies have been able to adapt, but you know, that for some enterprise companies, you know, well, internally running sales ops, I think has been a challenge, but then for some enterprise company, sales has taken a big hit in terms of their sales cycle and ASP. It's really important to be able to meet with clients in person. So the fact that that's now a little bit on hold, I, you know, we've definitely seen booking slow, unfortunately. Amazing. Now, on to the, the final question, and we, we ask this to, to every guest is, which uh, person in the world of sales ops would you love to take for lunch, whether you know them or not? <laughs> That's such a great question in the world of sales ops. I would say that I would want to take, um, so my old boss actually at Sumo Logic, his name is Ben Kwan. I would like to take him out to lunch. He has such an operationally focused brain and he is so good at setting up great processes and systems and teams and actually was a huge inspiration for me to want to continue in this world and really make a career out of it. He has extensive experience. He worked at Zora and now is still at Sumo Logic. And I think just really being able to pick his brain on how he thinks about coming into different companies, analyzing any pain points, and then fixing them is something that I don't think I could get enough of his time on. <laughs> Shout out to Ben. Um, yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Rachel, we're, we're at the end of the episode. I think it's been an incredible journey over the last year. It was actually only seven years ago that you joined, that you joined Salesforce. Um, yeah. so it was probably, it was approximately 10 years ago that you, uh, kind of set off on that road into finance, right? So yeah, it seems like it's been an incredible decade, let's say. Um, and it totally makes sense. Well, mostly like looking back, it does make sense the, the position that you're at today with this kind of growing sales loss business because it's combining that like entrepreneurial drive you had with this other discovered passion that you realized on the journey. So um, that was yeah, that was incredible to unlock that. I hope we also gave some kind of sales loss related insights to the audience as well, but I'm sure we did. Um, so Rachel, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. <laughs>